Hi, so I'm Hugo Bowne Anderson. I'm, I'm a data scientist at DataCamp. Hi, I'm David Aurelai. I'm a computational scientist at Continuum Analytics. And, and David and I, well, David, we've, he's just finished uh, recording uh, the third in our series of Pandas courses. This is on uh, combining da data frames in, in Pandas. Uh, so maybe you can tell us a bit about, about the, the, the course or the process of it. Uh, about designing the courses in, yeah. in data frame? Uh, in data camp? Okay. Uh, so um, so uh, we've been working, collaborating, uh, continuing and, and data camp in putting together a few courses. So we have, uh, you know, we first of all, we plan out sort of what it is that we want to do. We, we sketch out sort of the structure of what the high level picture of the course is. And we try and do a sort of a reverse course design, backwards course design process where we try and build the exercises and then sort of work backwards to make sure that everything we do in the lessons um, supports those things adequately. And it's an iterative process. There's a lot of going back and forth. And I spent a lot of time emailing and talking with Hugo here in order to, and my, and my team, of course, uh, the, uh, the people that continue and the other trainers uh, that work with me uh, have done a fantastic job of actually putting together some really interesting material, I think, that isn't, uh, that's very uh, subtle and difficult to get, I think, a lot of the time in Pandas. Absolutely. So. And something that I think you've done wonderfully in these courses is to uh, bring the theoretical material, but continually apply it with a bunch of different examples and, and case studies. Oh yeah, getting the data sets and figuring yeah. out how to do that is a really big yeah. part of it, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So maybe you can tell us a bit about y your team and what, what you do at Continuum. So, um, so I'm involved largely in training at Continuum. Uh, so we have, uh, we, we deliver training to various um, clients in various sectors. Uh, and we uh, are pushing, I guess, you know, sort of the general uh, open data science ecosystem. Uh, so largely Python, in, in because that's sort of where we kind of grew up, but also also R and to sort of the whole Anaconda ecosystem that uh, that we uh, we want to advocate for open data science, so people can actually sort of experiment thing things, um, try things out, uh, not get sort of locked into a particular way of doing things, find different tools, and, and move very quickly on the sort of the bleeding edge. Absolutely. So we're, uh, we're involved in, um, you know, so there's people at Continuum that actually do, uh, do development work and actually we're building some very sophisticated tools and libraries. Uh, we do consulting and training and various other kinds of activities yeah. as well. So you mentioned an Anaconda, which I think, you know, I've, I've been teaching data science in a variety of aspects respects for some time. I always used to teach it in R because the installs were so difficult for, for, for beginners uh, in, in Python land, but the Anaconda distribution was a game changer for that c oh, completely. Fundamentally, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and I mean, it's, it, you know, it's the, the leading sort of platform for open data science, right? It's the, uh, it's powered by Python, but it's actually now it's moving towards uh, um, being more agnostic, language agnostic, right? Yeah. So we're trying to but we're pushing R as a first-class citizen as well and trying to support people working in R as well. Um, and uh, I think there's a lot of great possibilities to, um, uh, for, for package management, but, but also for uh, just in general sort of gluing together different kinds of tools, which is one of the things that sort of Python had a, has a bit of a head start in in some sense. That's, that's fantastic because that leads to my, my next question, which is, well, it's kind of twofold. First, what do you love about Python? Why do you use it? Uh, and secondly, um, why why should our our students think about using Python if maybe they're using R? Ah, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, and let's see if I can think of a, a short answer for this. So I mean, I I like Python because of its elegance and its simplicity. It's mm. really a very uh, you know when I started using it, I, I used MATLAB for many years, mm. uh, and I've also you know programmed in lower level C and Fortran type languages for a long time as well. But uh, Python, when I sort of really started to learn to use it and get used to it, it sort of ha it has a real elegance to it as an interpreted and simple uh, language to use for sort of interactive development. Um, and where it fits in, I think, a little differently is it it inherits a certain amount of uh, it, so it's it's inherits a certain amount of structure from a um, the sort of the Unix operating system philosophy. Mm. So it's really designed to sort of. Uh, with a pipe and filter kind of model, where you can kind of join together very a lot of simple programs and get them to work together. So I think that's actually, and that's kind of an, that was one of the things that Python was designed for in the late 1980s, which 
accidentally uh, almost. It wasn't intended that um, scientific consumers would would really get excited by this, but they did. It was more for the development community, wasn't it? It was more for it was more for traditional sort of uh, developing Unix utilities at the command line, yeah. right? Because uh, so Guido Van Rossum, I think, was if I understand this correctly, he was sort of trying to find ways so that instead of having to program these utilities in C, mm. that you could actually use to pipe fill, pipe things together. Yeah. together. Uh, he wanted people to be able to do this in Python and have quicker development cycles. Absolutely. Uh, but it turned out that people were able to then, uh, but the nice thing about this model is it allows you to glue together different um, programs easily and, and make data analysis pipelines easily. Right. So Travis Oliphant, from, um, the, who designed NumPy when he was design, first designing, was f working on that mm. uh, or working on, a, on, pre on a earlier tools, was looking largely at um, uh, sort of, I think, MRI type of pipelines, right? And gluing yeah, together yeah. programs in Fortran and C and trying to get these things to play together nicely. Yeah. So I think this is, in particular, this is one of the things I would say, and I don't, I don't know R very well, yeah. so I, d I don't Absolutely. want, I'm not, I definitely don't want to be rubbishing, <laughs> uh, rubbishing anyone else's, I don't like to do that anyway in, in programming languages. But, um, but I think that, you know, R was designed with statistics in mind and, it, and just like MATLAB with matrix linear algebra in mind. Mm. Uh, and those tools are really good for those things, but when you start to try and build out from that, it's uh, there's a little bit of uh, it's it's a little bit difficult yep. to try and do that because uh, there's a different underlying design philosophies involved in the language, and I don't and I don't know how easy it is to sort of glue some of those things in. Yeah. Whereas I think Python, because it was designed with the explicit goal of gluing things together easily, yep. um, it actually you know so then you know other other scientific libraries came as an afterthought. And so the NumPy and uh, SciPy and uh, the, the, uh, the rest, Pandas and the rest of that scientific stack. Um, it wasn't the first thing with, with this, that was there, but it actually, you know, so it built, a, it, it sort of has borrowed from other um, sort of uh, mathematical libraries and, in, a, in a design. But, uh, it, you know, so it does those things quite well, uh, but you also have the ability to glue things together and uh, pipe uh, things from different data streams uh, relatively cleanly. Absolutely. And I find, and I think that's something that I don't know how easy that is to do in R yeah. or in, in other packages. I haven't actually yeah. experimented with it, but I suspect that would be one of the uh, when you actually start getting into very complicated data processing pipelines. Um, Python has a certain leverage of playing around with operating systems in a way that I think that R uh, may not. Absolutely, and I think also on on top of that. Um, Python can be relatively easily plugged into some sort of full stack development infrastructure. Yeah, so you yeah. can, you know, build up your your web apps and web infrastructure and have that with a database. And that's true. Um, yeah, yeah, and and, uh, and people do that. Yeah, definitely. Exactly. Um, so that's actually uh, one of the exciting sort of flexible t flexible things about that. Yeah. So the courses we've we've created together, we've created a number of data visualization courses and a number right. of of pandas data manipulation courses. And right. I think. Um, these are two of the most fundamental aspects of, of, of data science. Um, you also have machine learning and statistics and um, all, all of these types of things. Um, we have a lot of students out there who data science seems like this big kind of unbearable beast to deal with initially. So I was wondering if you had any words of advice to, to budding data scientists. Huh. Well, um, yeah, that's a really good question. I think the uh, what I would say is Figure out what kinds of problems you really want to solve. Uh, I think the uh, you know when you have a big problem, it's always very daunting and challenging to sort of get into it. And I think one of the things I learned way back when I was a graduate student is the important thing to do is ask the simple you know uh, most uh, idiotic questions first. Because if I can't answer the idi the idiotic questions, I'm not going to be able to answer any of the other deeper ones. So ask the simple questions first. Make sure I know what the answers are for those. And, and then just keep digging slowly. And when you break it into smaller pieces, that that amorphous you know blob of massive challenges out there, um, it gets more manageable. So um, you know, start small. I suppose is the way that I would uh, you know, if you're feeling overwhelmed, start small, and slowly as you start taking smaller bites, eventually you'll start taking bigger bites. Um, that's oh, good. That yeah. Advice, yeah. All right, well, well, that's it from me, David. It's been a, been a pleasure. It's been wonderful, Hugo. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you all enjoy the courses. As do I. All right, thank you.